David Newman, Pastor Meg around while I read. If you've got your Bibles, uh, turn to Romans chapter 13. The right one, isn't it, Mike? Yes, go ahead. Romans chapter 13. Let's, we're going to read the whole chapter. Romans chapter 30. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The, author the authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has ins instituted, and those who do, do so will bring judgment on themselves. For the rulers Hold no terror for those who do right, or for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from, from fear of, of, of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he, for he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword of, for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment, on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to authorities, not only because of, of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are good God's servant who give their full time to govern, to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt, re no, let no debt remain outstanding except the, the continuing, continuing, continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And whatever other commandments there may, may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not harm, love does no harm to his neighbor. Therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And to do this, and do, sorry, and do this understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now and when we first believe, then, we, then when we first believe. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here, so let us put, put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and de debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy, Rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. May the word of the Lord, uh, as is spoken, uh, challenge us, guide us, and bless us. Let's sing our next hymn before my mind comes over here uh, and um, leads us, uh, guides us in the message. Number 444 in mission phrase, Lord speak to me that I may speak.
you Sunday mornings. I hope these visits will have been some help to you and uh, some encouragement. It's been my or always is a privilege to share amongst you and I've had the joy of uh, being involved with you now. I think it must be, we must be going into about our 12th year since I originally was asked to come and give some support to Carly on behalf of FIC. And it's been a, a fascinating journey for me, even a more, more of a fascinating journey for you. So it's been encouraging to see how the Lord has blessed and encouraged you here on the St. Matthew's Estate. We've been assured of our prayers for you on a regular basis in our church in the Holy Day. Now, I want to ask you something, I want to give you something to think about this morning, and uh, it's this. How important do you think you are? <laughs> How important do you think you are? Now, probably, if you're a humble Christian, you may want to say, oh, I'm not important at all. Well, no, no. No, that's not very I'm not important. Well, hang on a minute. Think about it. You're going to be very important to at least some people. If you're married, you'll be very important to your spouse. As we say, when we stand there for better or for worse, or I was going to say for good or for evil, but no, that's not right, is it? <laughs> but you'll be important in one way or another to your spouse if you're married. Uh, as a parent, grandparent, a great grandparent, to all that's in your family, you will be important. Don't deny it. Uh, you'll be important if you're at work, to your work colleagues, not in the same way, and perhaps not to the same extent, but you'll still be important. If you're in school or college or something like that, you'll be important to the people that you study with or work with. You will be important to at least some people. Right or that's an extent. But the fact of the matter is that the vast majority of people who live in Leicester don't even know that you and I exist. And so therefore we'll be of no importance whatsoever to them. If somebody were to say to somebody anywhere around here, you know, about my twin, they'd never heard of him. Who's he? Of no importance whatsoever. But what I want to assure you of this morning is this: that if you are a Christian, you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. You are actually one of God's very important people. Every Christian to God is a VIP. God's people are very important people. How do we know that? Well, because of the text that I've been given to share with you this morning. Matthew chapter 5 and verses 13 and 14. It says this. You, speaking of the disciples in the first place, of course, and then going on to other to us in our day who are the Lord and trampled under men. You are the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Jesus is impressing on his disciples how important they are. They're salt, they're light, and they're a city. The simple way to remember it, most of you will have heard that the city, the capital, or the state capital of Utah is Salt Lake City. But all you've got to do is remember you are Salt Light City. And that's something you can easily remember. Salt. Why did he say that Christians are like salt? Well, what Jesus is doing here is giving Christians, his disciples, a picture of how they are to affect the world in which they live. That's what this is about. How are Christians to affect the world in which they live? And he starts off by describing them as salt. And salt, especially, well not especially, but I think over the, the centuries, has always been used for preservation. It's salt for preserving. Roman soldiers were paid wage, and part of their wage was called salt money. And the reason for that was that when Roman soldiers were going on campaign, they were able to have enough money to buy salt in order to salt their food, which they would then carry with them as they went on campaign, in order to preserve their food. It was called salt money. And apparently, I didn't know this till this week, apparently,
apparently that's where we get our word salary from. Salt money. People are paid a salary. We actually used to say years ago, and some of you golden oldies, I better be careful where I look, but some of you golden oldies will probably remember, we used to say that a good worker was worth his salt. And that's where it comes from. The idea is that these people have some kind of a preserving ability where they are and among the people they affect. So for many, many years, this idea of preservation was very prevalent in this country. Sailors, we're an island nation and we've always sailed and sailors would have their meat salty before they left in order to try and preserve it for as long as they possibly could. And so what Jesus is saying when he speaks to the disciples and says, you are the salt of the earth, he's saying, you are people who are in the world as a lasting preservative for the world. They are, that's important, very important. You are a lasting preservative in the world. So that then begs the question, but how? How can people like you and me be for the preservation of our world. Well, the first thing we can do is preserve the world through prayerful concern. We can preserve the world through prayerful concern. The Apostle Paul wrote to his young friend Timothy and said he was to encourage the church that, that they would pray for kings and all in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. And then he says, for this is good, and it pleases God. It's a good thing to pray for the authorities, that they may rule in a good way. Why? Because this benefits our society. It's a good thing when rulers rule well. And what's more, it pleases God because it helps to enable his own people to live in peace and with quiet lives in all godliness. It's interesting, in the Old Testament, the psalmist encourages God's people to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we need to be praying for peace in the Middle East, in the conflict in Gaza, and pray for peace in Ukraine and other places of the world. Now, I led us in prayer this morning, praying for countries where there's persecution and trouble and turmoil. Because if we pray for the nations of the world and the governments of the world, it's not only good for the gospel, not only good for Christian people, but actually it's good for everybody. It helps to preserve the cohesion of society. And I think only eternity will show us how beneficial the prayers of God's people have been down through the centuries to the world in general. You and I can often pray and we don't see the results. But who knows what good our prayers will have done in the world in which we live over the years. Prayerful concern is the way in which we help to preserve the society in which we live. And then also godly living. We read in Romans 13, love your neighbour as yourself, for love does no harm to your neighbour. Well, that's got to be a good thing. Not doing any harm to your neighbour. Loving them instead, it's good for them. It's good for society. The Apostle James in the New Testament said the religion that God the Father accepts as pure and faultless is to look after the orphans and look after the widows in distress and to keep yourself from being polluted by the world. That's got to be a good thing for society. It's interesting. If you take the trouble to read church history in this country particularly, what do you discover? You discover that down through the centuries it's Christians that founded hospitals, founded hospitals, founded hospices, founded schools, looked after the needy, and so on. So often, a, preser pre a preserving society by their godly living. The uh, prophet Micah in the Old Testament says, He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you to act justly, love mercy, walk humbly, 
with your God. Godly living is a very important part of helping to preserve the standards and the, and the health of the society in which we live. And the reason for that is because godliness, Christian, godly Christian behaviour, is noticed by non-Christian people. They do notice. It has an effect on people all around. Some of you know that for a, about a period of about 10 years or so, as I was coming up to retirement and just after, I, as a hobby, I used to umpire cricket matches. I'm in a, in a volunteer, volunteer capacity in a small way, but I was a cricket umpire. And uh, when you were got your gear on and you were about to go out onto the field to play and captains would toss up, as you were coming out, you would hear the captains in the dressing rooms addressing their teams. Very often, of course, because we're talking about the summer, the windows would be open. And uh, the teams got to know that I was a Christian and they, they used to call me Mick the Vic. I'm sure for vicar. They used to think of me as a vicar. And you'd hear the captains in the dressing room saying to the team, now listen you lot, and I heard it on various occasions, listen you lot, no swearing today, Mick the Vic's umpiring. <laughs> now, that was simply because they knew I was a Christian. And it was having some effect. And, it, and, and, and it's not that I, that I went and told them they mustn't swear, there are no rules in, in cricket that says you can't swear, but they just had this impression, you know, we're in the presence of a Christian. And it made a difference. Now, I'm not saying that because I'm wonderful or anything like that. I'm just saying it's a fact. Christians get notice and notice for what they stand for. I'm sure you've been in the, in the presence of non-Christians when they've sworn and said to you, oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's almost it's like a natural reaction. I'm sorry about that. Non-Christians notice godly behaviour and it benefits all around. But Jesus goes on to say here in verse 16, which I presume probably you're going to study another week, he says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works. And then praise your Father who is in heaven. Non-Christians notice the godliness of God's people. Salt is preserved for preserving and it helps to preserve the standards of society. And that's very important. That's why Christians are very important people. But also salt is for flavouring. Notice verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer any good for anything else. It's, it's also salt for flavouring. In the Old Testament, we read that the, the children of Israel were to season, they were to flavour all their grain offerings with salt. Now, probably this is what we mostly use salt for today. You uh, often on a recipe, don't you, it says season and you stick salt and pepper on it. Uh, I, I, can't, I, I don't use salt hardly at all myself, but I do have to have salt on my fish and chips. <laughs> so I stick my pickled onion on my plate and uh, put some vinegar on and a, and a sprinkling of salt. Why? Well, it kind of brings a flavour. It flavours, doesn't it? It savours. And in fact, Scripture talks about the offerings of the children of Israel being a savoury offering. It's one of the translations. It flavours the sacrifice. Well, it's a tasty offering to the Lord. But that's not just an Old Testament concept. Paul writes to the church in Colossians and he says, Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so you may know how to answer everyone. He's clearly talking about conversation because he says so you know I know how to answer. So he says your conversation he says should be seasoned with godly grace so that when you're in discussion with people and when you're talking to people your conversation flavours the discussion. 
It brings balance. It, it brings honesty. It brings thoughtfulness and reasonableness and, and sensible things. If you're a Christian whose conversation is seasoned with grace, you're not going to go around saying stupid things and harmful things and upsetting and offensive things. When our conversation is seasoned with godly grace, we know what we ought to say and what we shouldn't say and how we ought to do or not to say it. And consequently, our conversations and our discussions will help people to think and think in a more wholesome way. In other words, it does everybody else good. Another aspect of how we might preserve and savour and flavour the society in which we live is by being godly citizens, by being good godly citizens. Romans 13, Christians are sub to submit to the governing authorities. The chapter goes on, give everyone what you owe. Pay your taxes, pay your revenue, respect those in authority, honour those who deserve honour. And to everybody, behave decently. Be good citizens, in other words. Live a good, decent, upright life. When the children of Israel, sorry, when the people of Judah were invaded by the Babylonians and they were carried off to Babylon as exiles, the prophet Jeremiah wrote to them and said, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you will prosper too. Live as good citizens, even as captives in Babylon. Still live as good citizens and pray for the city, because if it prospers, everybody benefits, including you, says Jeremiah. And so Christians should live and behave and talk in as godly a way as they possibly can for the good of everybody they come in contact with. For the good of everybody. Even in an atheistic and idolatrous nation, such as in uh, Babylon, such as in Rome, uh, such as in Britain today, <laughs> under a godless government, we need to live as godly people for the good of our community. So Paul could write to the Christians in Rome, as we read in chapter 13, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. You see what he's saying? You've just gone through Matthew 5. Clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, live like these Beatitudes. Live like these Beatitudes. And then you'll be salt for sap for preserving, and you'll be salt for flavouring. Live like this, because this is how Jesus lived. Clothe yourself with these things. And that's how you'll be salt in the world. But there's a caveat in verse 13 that we need to notice. If the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Now, there's a little bit of a problem here in that uh, sodium chloride, which is uh, what salt is, doesn't actually decay. So I'm told. Sodium chloride, pure sodium chloride, doesn't decay. Salt, as such, doesn't lose its saltiness. So what does Jesus mean here when he says, if the salt loses its saltiness? Well, it's very simple. The answer is, very rarely, especially in olden times, would they have pure salt. The salt that they had and the salt that they mined and sold, in all probability, would almost always have impurities with it. So although the salt technically itself, apparently, doesn't decay, the compound does. That's the snack. The compound does. So that's what he's saying. If the compound of this salt starts to lose its saltiness, it becomes stale, 
then it's no longer any good, as he says in this verse. It's not good for anything, he said, except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Now, the problems with Christians being salt is this, and if you're a Christian, you will know this as well as I do. One of our problems is we are not pure salt, are we? We all know about the sin that easily entangles us. So we are more of a compound of salt, in fact. And the danger, therefore, for us is to lose our saltiness. In other words, to lose our ability to preserve and flavour the society in which we live. Because we acknowledge we are still full of many impurities. So what can we do? If we're to be preservative, flavour into our society, well what we've got to do is we've got to try and reduce the, the impurities so that the, the purity of the salt itself will become more and more effective. And that's why Paul says to Timothy, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. Be like these beatitudes, pursue them, work on them, endeavour to be like them increasingly. Yes, for your good, for the blessing of the Lord in your life, but in this context, for the good of everybody else. For the good of everybody else. So that we don't become, as Jesus describes the act, no longer good for anything. Only for being thrown out and trampled underfoot. You see what Jesus is saying is a backsliding Christian is neither useful to the Lord nor helpful to the world. A backsliding Christian is neither useful to the Lord nor helpful to the world. No longer a blessing to the people among whom we live. In fact, what Jesus is saying this is the less we become salty in the world in which we live, then we may as well not be there. That's what he says. It's only any good for being thrown out. That's a strong condemnation, isn't it? I think that of a lot of us Christians, and I certainly used to think about this like this myself, how I was brought up even as a young Christian, is this, that the backsliding is a personal thing. That, it, that it, it, it affects me and it affects my relationship with the Lord and, 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 and it, it discourages God's blessing in my life and so on and so forth. So that's why it focuses on me and it's detrimental to me. But what Jesus is saying here is this, that a, a, a saltiness or a, a saltiness type of Christian is actually detrimental to everybody else. And the danger is to become a good-for-nothing Christian. No longer good for anything, he says, in verse 13. What a terrible thing for a Christian to be described as. Isn't that challenging? It challenges me. Dear friends, let's not become good-for-nothing Christians. Because the Lord considers us and wants us to be salt for preserving and flavouring in this world in which we live. Brothers and sisters, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, endeavour every day not to lose your saltiness. It's very important <coughs> to remain salty for the Lord if you're one of God's very important persons for this world in which we live. But then secondly, in verse 14, he says, you know he's the salt of the earth, but you're the light of the world. You're the light of the world. Now when Jesus said this, he obviously doesn't mean you are the original light of the world. 
the original light of the world is the Lord himself. Go back to the beginning of the Bible. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. Why? Because God is light and light comes from God. And that's why Jesus says, as recorded in John's Gospel, I am the light of the world. So you and I are not the original lights. But as Paul says to the Ephesians, you Christians who were once darkness, and you were, we were in the darkness of Satan's kingdom, dominated by our sins, dead in trespasses and sins, you who were once in darkness are now light in the Lord. You are now light in the Lord because he's shown the light of his grace, the light of his love, the light of his gospel and good news into our hearts and lives. So he's turned us from darkness into being lights in the Lord. And that's why, again, as he says in verse 16 here, let your light shine now. The Lord has lit, lit up our lives. So shine it out, is what he's saying. And it's in that context that he says, you are the light of the world. Light is your what? It's light for revealing. Light for revealing. Seems a very obvious thing to say, but light is for lighting things up. You want to say something? Shine a light on it. Margaret lost one of her earring studs recently on the carpet. And uh, we, uh, we got a couple of torches out and we were looking under the bed and under the cupboard and all the rest. We were trying to light up the dark places in order to try and find this, um, this uh, stud that she was. We haven't found it, I don't think, have we yet, no. But we were trying to find it by shining a light. It lights up the dark places and reveals what's there. But in our case, what isn't there, where we've looked. And that's what a godly Christian life does. It reveals, it sheds a light for the world on who God is. Would you believe that? It sheds a light in the world on who God is. Christians, when people become Christians, they are made members of God's family. We describe as children of God. Listen to this verse from the New Testament. Be blameless and pure as children of God, without fault, in a crooked and depraved generation. So be blameless and pure as children of God in this dark and crooked world in which you live. And then he says, because you shine as lights in the universe. You're like stars in the sky, he says. Why should you live a godly life? Because it lights up the world around you. It's shining the light of the Lord out there. It's the light of the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the light of the way of salvation. So our godly living and our godly speaking helps to light others up, helps to light up for them who the Lord is. It lights up for them the way of salvation. It lights up for them the power, the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. It lights up for them what God has said, his commandments and his precious word. It, you, your life and your words and your behavior and your conversation throws light for the Lord on everybody you and I have anything to do with. You'll have heard it, I'm sure, because it's not an uncommon saying these days. It doesn't really matter how I live, as long as I don't do anybody any harm. Have you heard that? That's not an unusual saying these days. It doesn't matter how I live, as long as I don't do anybody any harm. That's an awful thing for a Christian to say, because it really does matter how a Christian lives, in order to do them good. It's the opposite of the world's way of looking at it. I can live as I like as long as I don't do any harm to Christians. No, it matters how I live, so I can do them some good. The very opposite of what the world thinks and says. 
So how a Christian lives, how we behave, how and what we say, really does matter. Because it does others good. It helps to prevent the downward spiral spiral of evil in this world and reveals to people the wonderful ways of our Lord and who he really is. I'm sure you've had that experience. When you've got the battery, you've got the torch out of the door, and you've switched it on, and it comes on, and then it goes down to a little tiny glow. Must have had that experience. I wonder sometimes whether us Christians were rather like that. Rather than being the bright light against the darkness of the world in which we live, we are more like a dying battery in a torch. What kind of Christian are we? Are we a preserving, flavouring salt? Are we a bright, revealing light for the Lord? And then he says, if you're going to be like salt like that, and if you're going to be light like that, then you're going to be like a city on a hill that cannot be hidden, verse 14. You're going to be like a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. And the city on a hill that cannot be hidden is a city for identifying. It's a city for identifying. When you see a city on a hill, it's obvious what it is and where it is. There it is. It's over there on the top of that hill. It's obvious. You can identify it. Margaret and I have good friends who live in Cocosson in the south of France. And some of you may well have been there. And the city, the old city of Cocosson, which is definitely, if you're a film buff, you'll have seen it because it's where Robin, uh, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, was filmed. A number of the scenes were filmed at Carcassonne, in what's called the city of the of Carcassonne. And it's up on the top of a hill, so it's, it's there. All the rest of the old the town now that's built up is down below on the plain, but there's Carcassonne. You can see it across the fields as you're driving to it. Oh, look, there it is. And it's obvious what it is. It's not a campsite. It's not a little tiny village or a hamlet. It's substantial buildings. People live there. It's populated. It's clearly a city. And it's set up there on the hill. And it's obvious where it is and what it is. And Jesus said, if you're going to live like salt and light, you're going to be obvious as to who you are, who you live for, and what you stand for. You're going to be obvious. You're going to be identifiable. There's a good example of this in the Acts of the Apostles. Peter and John, Jesus' disciples, they had healed a man at the gates of the temple in Jerusalem. And then they started preaching the good news of the gospel to the crowd that gathered round. And the religious leaders of the day, they were dismayed and, and distressed about this. And they arrested them and threatened them. But it is said of them that they took notes that Peter and John were unschooled ordinary men. They were fishermen. They were working class like me and many of you who probably think you're the same. But they took notes of them that they'd been to be with Jesus. Something was obvious about them. Something was clearly identified. These guys were different. Why? Because they'd been with Jesus. They were, there was something that was extra, extraordinary about them. They were excited with an amazing, wonderful message. They were energized by an inward strength. They were fully committed to a living Savior. They were clearly identifiable as belonging to Jesus. They were like a city on a hill. It was obvious who they were, what they were. Very clear. And to be salt and light and to be a city for the eye. If 
we are going to be like that. We're going to be among these people. Noticed. Taken note of. But in order to be like that, we are not going to be able to be salt of, salt of the earth if we've not already been salted ourselves. If we've not been salted already with the preserving and savoury power of eternal life <coughs> through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you already been made into a salty person? You can't be salt to the earth in which we live if you're not salty already by the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're not going to be light to this world to show who the Lord is unless the Lord has lightened us and enlightened our hearts and minds with his gospel, with his love and with his grace. We're not going to be a city on a hill unless we've already enjoying the transforming power of God, the Holy Spirit, in our hearts. We're not going to be salt and light in the city unless we've been made salty, light, and an identifiable city by the grace of God. That's why Christians are very important people. Salt Just something else that I want you to notice as we finish, it's this. The word you, the word you, Jesus said to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And then by implication, you are like a city set on the hill. That you, in the original language, is a plural word. So he's not talking to these, these disciples as individuals. He's not saying you and you and you. He's saying you all together are salt, light, and city. You all together. It's plural. And I think that's got a very, very practical application for you good folks right here in Carly Evangelical Baptist Church. Because it, it means as members together, as you serve the Lord together, as you gather together Sundays by Sundays and Wednesdays by Wednesdays and all the other activities that you engage in together on the St. Matthew's estate, as you go out together, you are being salt and light in the city to this area in which you serve the Lord. And therefore it's very important that you don't lose your saltiness, that you don't grow dim, that you be readily identifiable as a group of people who love and serve the Lord and are seeking to be a preservative, flavouring, light-shedding, identifiable people to this area in which you serve the Lord. And the last thing, therefore, is this. Don't be surprised if that produces persecution. Interesting, isn't it? That Jesus said to his disciples, you were sought by the city after he told them you'll be persecuted. So the terrible sad thing about the world is this. It persecutes the people who are best for it. It persecutes the people that can do it the most good. It persecutes the people who are like these Beatitudes. People who are pure, poor in spirit. People who are meek. People who hunger and thirst for righteousness. People who are merciful. People who are pure in heart. People who are seeking the peace. And yet it persecutes people like that. It persecutes people who are salt, light, and acidic. So don't be surprised if as you become more salty, more brilliant, and more identifiable, if more opposition is of the rise, even to the point of persecution. But remember, that's what you folks have called to be. You've called to be salt for preserving, flavouring, 
light for revealing the Lord and all that he stands for and all that he is. Like a city set on a hill, obviously identifiable as God's very important. <laughs>